Hello, and welcome back to Understanding the Old Testament. I'm Brennan Breed, and this session, we're going to be talking about the writings. And in particular, we're going to be talking about the book of Psalms. Uh, you've probably encountered the Psalms quite a bit. Uh, you've probably heard about them a lot. Uh, they are much loved, much used by religious folks in liturgical settings. But I actually find that they're often poorly understood. People kind of listen to them for a while and say, what's going on in the Psalm? Why is this person complaining so much? Or... Uh, what do these things mean? Why are they repeating themselves so often? Uh, so there's a few things that we're going to talk about today to try to uh, explain the Psalms and how to use them. Uh, but before we even get there, we're going to talk a little bit about the writings. So we've talked about the, the canon, the canon meaning kind of the group of things in the Old Testament, the group of writings that constitute the Old Testament. Um, if you want to call it this, maybe the, the uh, table of contents of the Old Testament, right? And if something's not in the canon, then it's not in the Old Testament. So the canon being kind of that, that list of books. Well, there's three different groups in that list, right? The first being the Torah. And uh, in Judaism, that's the most essential part of the Bible. That's the, the most uh, sacred part, really. It's the part that God speaks through the clearest is the books of Moses, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? So the Torah, uh, the kind of God's main instruction book, uh, the core, really, of the Bible. Uh, but then you've got the prophets, right? The latter prophets. So the what we think of Christians mainly as the history books. So the books of Joshua and Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. And then we also have uh, the latter prophets or what Christians call the, the prophetic books, uh, including our major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Uh, and then also our minor prophets. So the book of the 12, right? Including Hosea, Amos, Joel, Jonah, and so on. Even books like Obadiah and Habakkuk that very few people have ever read, which are kind of amazing. Uh, so all to say that these are uh, the two parts of the canon we've talked about so far, and the one final remaining part of the canon is the writings. Uh, in in the, the three kind of part schema, the three part categories of the canon here, we've got Torah, uh, the God's instruction, we've got the Nevi'im or the prophets, and then this third part, the Ketuvim or the writings. Uh, writings is, is pretty vague, right? Just stuff that everything's written in the Bible. So the writings, and it really is kind of a third catch-all category. Um, there's a, a point in the New Testament in which uh, Jesus is kind of asked about uh, the scriptures. And, you know, he says the, uh, the law and, uh, and he, he talks about the prophets. And then he uh, talks about David as well. Uh, David being kind of the catch-all character that ties together these writings in the third part of the Bible, but also Solomon in a way. Solomon is kind of the figurehead for wisdom in the Bible. David being the figurehead for the Psalms. Um, these are not necessarily authorship ascriptions in the ancient world. The same thing as Moses. Moses didn't write all of the books of Moses. Uh, they, Moses is a, like, kind of like the patron saint of those, uh, in a way, of those of those texts. Uh, he's the kind of ancient figurehead for all of them, the one that gathers or collects, uh, whose, whose character kind of collects all these writings uh, together and authorizes them in a way. Uh, that's a, a bit what David is doing here for the Psalms. Um, uh, Solomon kind of plays a role in this part of the canon as well. Uh, but then you've also got lots of books that have nothing to do with David or Solomon, uh, and they're just kind of gathered. It's like the stuff that got thought of as being biblical later than the other than the prophets uh, and and the Torah. And that includes the book of Psalms, which uh, basically functioned as like an anthology of religious songs that were popular and important at different points in Israel's history and in Judah's history. Uh, and then you've got the book of Proverbs, which is a uh, collected wisdom of ancient Israel. You have the book of Job, which is uh, a deeper, think, like a philosophical reflection on some of those ideas about wisdom that are important in ancient Israel, including the questions of justice, uh, questions of suffering, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, those three books, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, are summed, summed up here uh, with this word emet, this biblical word, which means truth. Uh, Sifrei emet, the scrolls of truth, is um, what these books are often called in Jewish tradition. Uh, and they're thought, thought of as kind of functioning as a unit, <clears throat> like the songs and poetry and deep reflection of ancient Israel. And then you have a subgroup of the writings, which is called the Megalot, or the five scrolls. Uh, 
Uh, these five scrolls are Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. And you might say those have nothing in common with one another. Ruth is a story about a mo young Moabite woman who finds her way into Judah. Um, the Song of Songs is ancient love poetry. Lamentations is ancient grief poetry. Ecclesiastes is ancient philosophical reflection uh, in a somewhat cynical tone. And uh, Esther is a story about a young woman who's Jewish, but who's kind of hidden her Jewishness and who is surviving in the court of a foreign king. None of these really share much with the, the other books, uh, but all of them are collected together in the five scrolls because they're all read at important Jewish festivals. So the Song of Songs is read at Passover. Ruth is read at Shavuot, or what's often called Pentecost in the Christian tradition, uh, which was a, an ingathering of uh, crops, which takes place in the story of Ruth. Lamentations is read at Tisha B'Av, or the ninth of Av. Av is a month. The ninth day of Av in the Jewish calendar is a day to, to remember the destructions, the destructions of the temple, uh, the first temple and the second temple, but also uh, to remember the, the many uh, trials and tribulations that have uh, uh, fallen on the Jewish people over history, uh, a day of grief in a way. Uh, and then uh, Ecclesiastes uh, is read uh, on the... Uh, and then Ecclesiastes is um, read on the festival of Sukkot, which is kind of a fun, it's a fun, uh, it's a festival about fun, about enjoying life, uh, and also the transitoriness of life, uh, that uh, you'll find Jewish families sitting under kind of outdoor tent-like structures, playing games, having fun. Uh, and this is uh, that festival of Sukkot or booths. Booths, I mean, really tents. The festival of tents would be like a better way to, to put it. Um, and then lastly, Esther, which is uh, associated with another fun festival, Purim, uh, which is a bit like a Jewish version of uh, Halloween and uh, it's like a dress up kind of thing and uh, a lot of inversions and of, of cultural norms, a lot of drinking, a lot of fun ha being had. Um, so it's a, a fascinating day. Uh, all to say that these five major festivals each have a book associated with them that's read uh, on those days or near them. Uh, and that uh, constitutes this, this five scroll collection, the megalo, that's why they're collected together. Uh, and then we have three books, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles, which are all uh, written quite late. Uh, and all deal with, uh, to greater or lesser degree, um, or, or at least edge into the Persian period. Uh, so the Persian kings uh, feature at least a bit uh, in these books, or, or in Ezra and Nehemiah's case there, the entirety of the book. Uh, these kind of late historical-ish books um, got collected together uh, and formed the, the very last part of the Ketuvim, uh, or the writings. So the Torah the prophets and the writings, the three groups of scripture in uh, in, in Judaism. Um, and it's, a, in, I think, at least an instructive way for Christians to think about the canon as well, and the organization of the canon. It's a bit different than in Christian tradition, uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, fascinating as well. So uh, one thing that I'm gonna, we're going to focus on today is the Psalms. Uh, I mean, this is like a little entryway into the writings, but also uh, the Psalms are just the most important book of the writings for Christian practice, uh, for Christian um, prayer life uh, for Christian liturgy. So I'm uh, not not to, not to demean these other books. I mean, I wrote my dissertation on Job. So I'm uh, and and I've written a book on uh, co-written a book on Daniel and written a bunch of things. I mean, on um, Proverbs and and so I'm not to, not putting those <laughs> books down. Uh, uh, I care about them quite a bit. Uh, but all the same, uh, if I've got one hour to talk about the writings, I'm going to talk about the Psalms because I think they matter for uh, for Christian life and Christian practice with folks like you who are going to be ministering. So, <clears throat> all to say, uh, as I said before, I think that the Psalms have uh, and offer an amazingly rich uh, resource for Christian life and faith, but at the same time, uh, they are often misunderstood, I think. Um, if you think about the Psalms and what, what they are, uh, there are words to God. They're the words that, that we write to God in the text. Uh, so, the, the book of Isaiah, let's say, um, has a lot of oracles from God to humans. Uh, you can think of like the law being a way of God kind of communicating to and with humans. Uh, but the Psalms, that's that's not God speaking to us. That's us speaking back to God. Uh, some people have talked about this as like a script, uh, a script for the relationship uh, between us and God. And I'll talk about this more as we get in there. Uh, but uh, one of the best ways, I think, of thinking about the Psalms, because they are hard to read sometimes. I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, Christian books of liturgy, 
uh, often sanitize the Psalms. Like you'll read a couple of verses and then they'll skip some. Uh, they'll cut them out. Uh, oftentimes if you pray with them, there are certain Psalms you'll never read uh, as like in a, in a hymnal uh, or as an encouragement to prayer. Um, like Psalm 88 is oftentimes not included in some of these or, uh, or parts of Psalms are cut out because they offend our sensibilities. Um, but John Calvin, <clears throat> the famous theologian, Reformation theologian, uh, he said something about the Psalms in his, uh, in his uh, commentary on the Psalms that I thought was really quite amazing. This is from his commentary on the Psalms from 1563. Uh, he called the Psalms an anatomy of all parts of the soul. And he said, and here I quote, there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented in the book of Psalms as if in a mirror. All the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities with which the minds of people are wont to be agitated. When you see the Psalms, you see human emotions displayed large and they aren't sanitized and they aren't edited. Uh, the unedited view of life is put on the stage for you to look at. Uh, just like the uh, these anatomy shows you might see on television, right? Or like a surgery shows, which are pretty brutal and I can't really watch them. But at the same time, you, you, you see this brutal surgery taking place, right? This someone's skin is being cut open and something is happening to it. Oof, it gives me the willies. Um, not all parts of the interior of the human body are uh, beautiful, right? Uh, when we cut ourselves open and see, uh, it can be kind of scary uh, how gross and weird we are on the inside, right? Uh, at the same time, all those parts of our body are necessary for us to function. Not all equally necessary. I guess we can get along without our tonsils, right? Um, but the more they do research on the human body, well, yeah, tonsils actually do something too. Um, that is to say uh, that parts of our body have a function uh, and it may not be to, to look beautiful uh, or it may not be uh, like fun to look at them and watch them at work. I'm sure to watch a human stomach work would be kind of weird. At the same time, I'm really glad I have one and that it works. Uh, we, we need these parts of our bodies, uh, uh, even though they may seem shameful, some of them. At the same time, in a similar way, our emotional lives are necessary. We have to feel grief and pain and anger and even hatred is a natural human emotion. Uh, well, we hear some things in the Bible that God hates and it's not said in a way that's like negative. I mean, hating something sometimes is necessary. So all to say that these parts of our emotional life that disturb us or make us want to look away sometimes, um, those are on display in the Psalms and they're on display precisely because the Psalter is supposed to show us who we are. Uh, and help us to admit these things that we feel and that we think and that we don't want to say in public. Because the Psalms are our conversation with God. And in the Episcopal liturgy, uh, it's one of the things you say in the Episcopal liturgy is, you know, God, um, uh, from whom no secrets are hid. Walter Brueggemann, who I'll mention later in this presentation, um, has written a book uh, a called From Whom No Secrets Are Hid. And that idea is that the, the Psalms you're not supposed to hide what you feel. God already knows it. So just say it. <laughs> if you're feeling hatred, tell God hatred. You, know, you don't have to walk out in the streets and spew hatred, right, at, at people. Uh, but this is a conversation with God. Uh, and think about God as someone who already knows. But it's important, even if your spouse knows something, if you don't tell them, you're not sharing your whole self with them. Uh, even if someone knows something, it's good to say something. Now say it out loud. Like everyone knows that you said something uh, painful. <laughs> it's good to say, I said something painful. I'm sorry I said that, <laughs> right? It does a world of good. Even if everyone in the room knows that you know that you said that and they know that you said that. Uh, all to say that the, the Psalms kind of help us to speak the truth. Uh, in the words of Shakespeare, speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. So, <clears throat> This presence of this uh, disturbing side of faith, uh, lament, complaint, protest, and curse, that's what we find in the Psalms. And actually, it's more Psalms are angry or sad than they are happy and praiseworthy. Uh, so in our culture, you may hear people saying things like, well, what it means to really be a Christian is that you're supposed to be happy no matter what, or glad no matter what, or optimistic no matter what, or um, be joyful all the time. And I know that's quoting Paul and the, you know, the, the, the idea, the, the basic idea is that, you know, you're supposed to remember what Jesus has done and be happy for it. But the actual truth is that uh, the folks that focus on this stuff, like 
Joel Osteen or the power of positive thinking kind of stuff. Um, every day is a Friday, that kind of thing. Um, the majority of the Psalter <laughs> is very far from that kind of thinking. And if you think about the Psalter, the Psalms, uh, the, the book of the Psalms is usually referred to as the Psalter. When you think of the Psalms or the Psalter as trying to encourage us to share what we truly feel, warts and all, uh, I think it's a very, uh, it's a much more healthy way to deal with our feelings, our emotions, ourselves, uh, and to deal with our relationship with God. So why do we use poetry for this though? Well, uh, there's a lot of ways to talk about this, but um, I think it's important to note that um, when prophets uh, want to deliver an oracle, God often speaks in poetry. Um, in the Song of Songs, we wanna express the depths of human love. Uh, we, we use poetry to do that. Um, when you want to say something deep and emotional to someone, oftentimes words that are in prose don't seem to cut it. Uh, we want to sing a song or we want to make a poem. Uh, the reason is that poetry is the, the art form that elevates human language. So we think about it like um, music elevates sound uh, and a visual art uh, kind of lifts up color and shape, space, perspective. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, kind of culinary art lifts up taste, right? Well, in the same way poetry is that use of language that lifts language up as the art form itself. So if you wanna express yourself in it, whenever you wanna express yourself, you, you kinda of have to do it through language sooner or later. You have to say something if someone else is gonna know something about you. You're gonna to have to share something and you have to squeeze it into language if you're gonna want someone else to really understand the fullness of who you are. Uh, this is why I think, you know, God says, uh, let there be light in the beginning. The power of words to create um, is essential to the universe. Uh, and this is why when God wants to express who God is to us, God expresses it through the word, uh, the word made flesh. So all to say that words um, themselves uh, elevated to their highest form of power uh, is poetry. Uh, maybe it's maybe you don't like poetry, but maybe maybe you just haven't spent enough time with it. Uh, I think or maybe you haven't read good poems. <laughs> good poems, uh, like Emily Dickinson said, uh, poetry, good poetry, is supposed to blow your head off. It's supposed to make your head explode, according to Emily Dickinson, and I think she does that for me. If you haven't read any of Emily Dickinson's poems, just Google her and, and find some of her poetry. They're short and they're amazing. Uh, well, not all terribly short, but most of them are just brief and powerful. Uh, so. In any event, the focus of poetry is on the form and significance of words and how they play together. Um, language put to a special purpose, that's poetry. Uh, so the Psalms is Israel's principal collection of religious poetry. Um, some of this might have been sung, some of it wasn't sung, we'll get to that, but we can see music kind of used in some of these, like some of the headings of some of the Psalms. Um, when you uh, look, some of these Psalms seem to be written by the Korahites, which was like a like the choir of the ancient temple. Um, some of these Psalms have um, headings that seem to have something to do with music or musicality, like on the eighth, Shigia note, or to the leader is what some of these Psalms, how they begin, uh, this kind of rubric in a way, the lit liturgical rubric, which seems to maybe be to like, to the person who's like running the choir, um, yes, perhaps. Um, and then there's sometimes like some things that say like a, a particular um, types of music, perhaps or particular musical notations. One thing is it, uh, the Salah, you, if you read the Psalms, you see this word, S-E-L-A-H, Salah. We don't know what it means, but it might have something to do with like a musical interlude or a musical break or playing the melody with instruments or a chorus, something like that. We're not sure, we don't know what it means anymore. We lost some of the significance um, of some of these terms, but we know that it kind of generally goes back to, um, to to singing and playing instruments, but but not all of them. Psalm 1 doesn't seem to be about singing. Psalm 1 tells us it's about, it, Psalm 1 thinks of the book of Psalms as kind of like muttering about them, repeating them to oneself over and over again, like using it as a prayer book. Um, Psalm 1 seems to have been written really late. Um, like someone wrote it kind of as an introduction to the Psalter in order to kind of help you figure out how to use it. Um, and one of the ways to use it is to mutter on it, it says. Like repeat this to yourself over and over again. Um, so it's not all musical, but it's all poetry. That's one important thing. Uh, so uh, wh when you read Hebrew poetry, uh, the key to it, and you can even see how this is kind of like lined out, it's written this way in Hebrew. Uh, the, the key to it in a way is that it repeats. Um, so uh, if you look at, for example, um, like uh, Psalm 15, 
Uh, psalm 15 is a psalm uh, where we can um, uh, take a look at this kind of repetition. So, O oh Lord, who may abide in your holy tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? So the tent, that's the tabernacle, God's holy tent. Holy means set apart. So who may get, go into your holy tent? Who may go into your the, the tabernacle? So this is imagining Israel in the wilderness when they had a tabernacle before they have a temple. God's wandering around in the desert and Israel's the tribes of Israel are wandering around with, with Yahweh. Uh, and who, who can go into that tent? Uh, and then who may dwell on your holy hill, which is now envisioning Jerusalem, uh, probably, um, the hill, uh, Zion, uh, the mountain. And so the, the tent and, and the mountain are kind of like put together. But you notice it's, it's a little bit like repetition. Abide and dwell are kind of the same word. And tent and hill are, are like, they're not the same thing. They're actually different. The, the hill, that's talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but the tent is talking about the tabernacle. But the tabernacle and the temple are kind of the same thing. There's like drawing this analogy between these two places and spaces. And in a way, that's how Hebrew poetry works. Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme. That's what a lot of English speakers think is that rhyme is what poems are all about. But in fact, a lot of poems don't rhyme. And in Hebrew, they never do. Well, no, I shouldn't say never, but that's not the point of, of them. Now, there's some kind of beat to the poetry. There's like a, a rhythm to the poetry in Hebrew, but it's not direct all the time. It's not exactly explicit. Um, but what it does is it rhymes in thoughts. It's thought rhyme. Um, so you'll see these two lines, sometimes three lines, that kind of repeat themselves, but they don't repeat exactly. There's always a twist to it. So who may abide in your tent? Now we're thinking of the wilderness, Israel wandering, but then who may dwell on your holy hill? Now we're thinking of Jerusalem and the temple, and we're drawing this connection between this ancient God who moves around and this God who's now ensconced in this giant uh, mountainous sanctuary that's like a fortress. The God of the ancient uh, matriarchs and patriarchs, the God of our ancestors, is the God that we find here in this space. That's what it's trying to say, but it only really says it through this kind of poetic uh, what they call parallelism. The first line and the second line aren't saying exactly the same thing, but they're saying something different. One biblical scholar says, here's how you should read it. Think about that first line, who shall dwell in your, uh, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? That's line A. And then the second line is line B, who may dwell in your holy hill? And think of it as like, A, what's more B? And try to think like, what is the what's more? Like, why did you repeat it this way? What depth of meaning are you adding by repeating this thing in this way? So, in other words, that's kind of the core way that Hebrew poetry works, this way of parallelism or putting that. And so it, that makes the poetry a lot less boring because you're thinking of it in terms of thought rhymes, but the rhymes aren't exactly the same. They're kind of pushing you somewhere, leading you somewhere, helping you to grow the thought or change the place or, or uh, add some depth of meaning to something. And it's a bit of a game. It's like you, you, we have to sit and think about it. And there's not one right answer. There's lots of things you can imagine, or it can push you in lots of directions, right? There's not one way to read uh, any poem. Uh, but in any event, all to say, that's a good, it's a little, little quick introduction to Hebrew poetry. There's a lot more that I can say about that, and I'll link uh, some more information. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, in this course so that you can find uh, more resources on psalms and on parallelism in particular. But uh, the psalms, as I said, um, many of them, not all of them, many of them imagine themselves kind of in a setting of the temple. Kind of like Psalm 15, if we want to stick with that for a second. O Lord, who can come into your holy tent, who may dwell on your holy hill. And then we hear the answer, those who walk blamelessly and do what it's right, speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue. It's kind of like a, a, a liturgy in a way. And a lot of people think this is actually a liturgy. Psalm 15 is a liturgy of people trying to ask for entrance into the temple. So the people have to say, the priests either say the beginning or the priests say the end. I mean, what, what, we don't know which way it happened, but you can imagine um, the, the people coming and saying, oh Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, knocking on the door of the temple. And the priests inside say, those who walk blamelessly, those who do what's right, those who speak truth from the heart and so on. And at the very end, the people answer, those who do these things shall never be moved. In other words, we're not going away because we've done those things, right? We've been good. Let us into the temple, right? So all to say that this is, might be an entrance liturgy into the temple because they don't want people who have been uh, uh, consciously uh, hating God or whatever to come into the temple and offer worship because uh, like fake worship or something um, because God actually says God doesn't want that to happen. Uh, uh, that's a part of Leviticus, right? So in any event, uh, Psalm 24 is almost that same Psalm, but it's a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's got this kind of uh, beginning. It's, it's another entrance liturgy, we think. Um, but that verse three, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts 
who don't lift, lift up their souls to what's false. Again, an entrance liturgy into the temple, probably. But then, verse 7, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. You can hear a call and response here. And lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, O ancient doors, the king of glory may come in. This is about the Ark of the Covenant, which was God's mobile throne. And it's understood that God is seated invisibly on this mobile throne. And that when you take the Ark of the Covenant out of the temple, uh, you're taking it out to battle or something like that, right? But you're taking it out of the temple. And when you bring it back in, you got to tell the gates to raise up their heads of the temple because the, you don't want God to bonk, bonk the divine head on, on these doors, right? The, that's how big God is. God's so big, the doors, raise your heads. It's, a, it's, it's supposed to be like, almost funny, I think, even. Um, hey, God is so big, God is so great that the temple's got to jump up in the air so God doesn't bonk the you know the divine head on the door when we, when we bring in this in, right? Who is this king of glory? Who's so big? Yahweh of hosts. That's the king of glory. That's the end of that psalm, Psalm 24. So it's an entrance liturgy for the for the, for the the Ark of the Covenant coming into the temple uh, with the people who are trying to get in, who are carrying it probably, or who are processing with it as a procession, right? And so at the beginning, you have this like, can we come in? Yes, if you're, you know, a pure of heart. And then, hey, the gates, we can come in, but can, can you bump your, you know, bump up your, your head so that you don't hit God's head, right? Uh, so th this is a, uh, um, uh, uh, it's supposed to be um, imagined being enacted. Uh, and you can see this in other Psalms too. Um, like if you uh, take a look at uh, Psalm 150, talking about music, the last Psalm in the Psalter. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise God with the trumpet, with the lute and harp, with the tambourine and dance. You can imagine like little solos, you know. Praise God with strings and pipe, verse 4. And the strings guy goes, boo, 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 and the pipe guy goes, doo, 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 right? You know, like little little solos or whatever. I imagine that's actually what happened. Um, uh, at least that strikes me that that's quite possible. Uh, if you look at Psalm 118, that's another one where you can sort of see some of this um, uh, singing. Uh, you can see that there's a refrain in parts of this. Uh, God's steadfast love endures forever. And then it says, it says, Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, for Yahweh is good. God, Yahweh's steadfast love endures forever. Verse 2, let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, so the priests, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, God's steadfast love endures forever. This is like the choir director is pointing to everyone. Let all Israel say this. And then they say it. And then, hey, just the priest now. Okay. And how about those who fear the Lord say this now, right? So that, they, you know, it's like, and how about, how about, you know, just the, just the parents out there and then just the kids out there, right? You know, they're like calling out. So this is like a call and response kind of thing um, that you can see in some of these Psalms. Um, uh, and if you just kind of turn around and think of it that way, you can sort of imagine a lot of these being um, performed. Uh, being performed and being in, in beautiful ways. Now, there's other ones like Psalm 119 that I don't think was ever performed. It's way too long. Uh, and it's one of those psalms that thinks about meditating on the Psalter some. So some of these are kind of for personal use. I think Psalm 2 was a coronation psalm for a king. It was on the day that a king was crowned. That's why it's an important one for Jesus. Not because it only ever spoke about Jesus, but because it spoke about the coronation of a, of a new king. And if you want to talk about Jesus as a king, there's probably some stuff in there that you can apply to Jesus in a way. But that doesn't mean it only ever referred to Jesus. It means that it's about the Davidic kings being installed in the throne on Jerusalem uh, at a particular point in time. Uh, so, uh, in any event, these uh, this, these different kind of uh, rubrics, or you can say, like these different kind of settings in life, you can see throughout the Psalter. Some of them, Psalm 45 is the weirdest psalm, I think. That one's like for a... a, a marriage day for a king and it's like it doesn't even talk about god very much it's like hey let me think about how awesome the king is um of course that can be used metaphorically to think about god but it probably originates uh as a, literally a song to like pump up a king for a wedding day <laughs> right kings get married all right um that's it uh and some of them um would have been uh uh had these other kind of settings we can see in life uh that wouldn't have been necessarily in the temple some of them would have been local uh, here's the Beersheba altar. Um, I know it says in the Bible that they don't like that, you know, they only had the one altar in Jerusalem, but they had altars all over the place. The prophets yell at them about this a lot. We know that there were local altars all over Israel and Judah. And that makes a lot of sense, actually, because people can't just travel to Jerusalem all the time to do their religious um, vows, like, you know, like to uphold the things that they've asked God for, to, um, that they've promised God. Uh, you can't just go there when, when your kid gets sick and you want to pray to God and ask a priest to, to for a blessing. You can't just walk to Jerusalem all the time and leave your family behind, right? I mean, these are 
poor farmers. Um, so they had local religious folks. Um, sometimes they're described as Levites in the Bible, the local religious folks, but we, we've also got altars and stuff. We know some of these folks were priests that lived in the local towns. Um, like I said, there were different points in, in, in the history of Judah where certain kings like Hezekiah and Josiah tried to centralize religion more in Jerusalem, a religious authority. Um, but the fact they have to do that tells us that people were oftentimes outside of that authority. And so we have these psalms that are about being sick and wanting to get well or about a sick family member or um, anger at people who are trying to attack you, uh, who are trying to out to get you. Um, and a lot of these psalms we think probably originate um, in not in the main temple, um, they're not part of the temple liturgy, but they're they're kind of local people um, who had problems, and they seem to have over time been like decontextualized. Like these psalms might have first have been like really specific, but if you look through the psalms now, it's like all the problems are very vague. Um, like if enemies are mentioned, it's not like Bob in accounting. Um, they're not specific people who are being named, and that's because these psalms were probably had the specific stuff taken out of them at some point because they were beautiful. Uh, prayers that were uttered, and someone said, I want to be able to use that, but Bob in accounting is not my problem. Um, but in order to make it useful to everyone, enemies was put in. Uh, or if you look at like the problems that people have with their bodies in the Psalms, it's like all the problems at once. It's like people are saying, my bones hurt, my I'm sweating blood, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't see, like my eyes are hurting. It's like everything bad is happening to them all at once. Um, uh, they're not very specific symptoms. Uh, and the reason I think is that, um, and sometimes they're like um, emotional symptoms purely, or sometimes they're purely physical symptoms, and sometimes they're kind of everything. And I think the idea is, is that you kind of fill in the gaps. Uh, it's, it's in order for you to, to express yourself, and you can even kind of change it to fit you. That's kind of the point, I think, of the Psalms. They're like a, a general rubric. Um, when you're feeling really sad, say this, but you can put in the stuff that that's personal to you into that psalm. It's like a prompt, a script, right? But the script's got some holes in it, like Mad Libs, right? You could add in some stuff that's personal to you in order to fill it out and make it more robust as a prayer. That's at least my suggestion. Um, and we know that this thing, uh, the, the, these, uh, these psalms also um, uh, reflect uh, different types of songs. Uh, so we can look through the Psalter, and in fact, there's lots of folks um, who have looked through the Psalter and said, this is a jumble, a mishmash of like lots of crazy different songs, and uh, what do I do with this stuff? Or people are like, well, I guess I open it to a random psalm and I read that one, it's supposed to help me. Not exactly. Think about like a hymn book, right? If you have your hymn book for your denomination, you open it up to a random hymn, uh, that might not fit the, the part of the service that you're at right then, right? So you don't pick your hymns randomly. Um, instead, if you look at how hymn books are organized, they're organized with like um, uh, something like uh, entrance songs, you know, songs for the beginning or songs about the morning or songs, you know, and then there's maybe some like songs for uh, like confession and songs for Eucharist or worship uh, and songs for, for um, confession, songs for... Um, uh, like entrance or, or, or uh, you know, pr processing out of the church, you know, uh, songs for the peace, uh, songs for communion time, right? So you have all these songs that kind of fit different things um, or different seasons, right? You have all your Advent songs, you have all your Christmas songs, you have all your Easter songs, your, you know, you have, you have all this stuff, uh, your Lent, you know, sad songs. You have all these things kind of like separated out in the hymn book uh, so, that, so that it's useful to you. Well, in the Psalms, they didn't do that exactly. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't separate it like that. What they did was they took the oldest songs that they had that they thought were really good and they stuck them together and that's book one of the psalms uh and then the psalms that came along a little bit later that were super helpful they just kind of organized the psalm too and then uh, the second book of psalms and there's five books in the psalms just kind of like there's five books of moses right there's five books of david the five books in the psalms book one book two book three before they don't have names it's just book one book two book three uh but uh but i'll just say it's it's like kind of like an analogy to to moses right there's these five books of the psalms um the, the thing to know, though, is that uh, books one through three are primarily laments, and then four and five, you start to move more into praise. That is to say that the Psalms begin with some, some great praise hymns, like Psalm 8 is a great praise hymn near the beginning, um, but there's a predominance of pain uh, in the beginning of the Psalter. It's almost like it's meant to move you uh, from pain to praise. 
and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. A fairy tale pulls up something like a setting in life, right? Like you can imagine where do you tell fairy tales? Well, like parents tell them to children or grandparents tell them to children or uh, a teacher, right? But you kind of get this like vague idea about a place where this makes sense, like you would use it there, uh, you know? And so in that same way, we can look at the, at the Psalter, and this is a guy named Hermann Gunkel was the first guy to uh, really propose this in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century. And he said, if you look at the Psalms, you can kind of divide them up into these three main categories or genres. And they all seem to stick with like, fit with a particular setting in the ancient world. Um, so you can look at these three different groups, like there's hymns, hymns meaning hymns of praise. So there's these praise songs, like Psalm 8, how wonderful is God, how great is God, or Psalm 150, praise God with this, praise God with that. And then you can see that there's, an, and, and this kind of envisions a particular setting in life, right? Like a, a, a nice day, right? You know, everything's going great. Uh, uh, you're, you're praising God, usually in the temple, sometimes like individually, whatever, but something good's happened. You're happy, nah, you know, not, nothing too bad's going on, right? Uh, then you have the second main category, which is laments. Laments uh, assume that something bad has happened, right? There's been a tragedy, there's been something, um, some, some problem, some issue uh, that has caused pain in someone's life. Uh, and, and a lament is really a request for God's help. Uh, but also it can sometimes be an expression of anger, an expression of distrust, an expression of grief, of suffering. Uh, this is the part where you spill your guts out to God, whatever you're feeling. And uh, there's, um, there's an encouragement to be honest about this. Um, that's really quite amazing. Uh, and this envisions usually um, someone coming to a priest and, and saying, I gotta yell at God, or I gotta ask God for something, or I'm in trouble. And the priest says, okay, I got, I got what you need. You know, let's, let's pray to God. And here's kind of a script, right? Here's a psalm of lament to, to say. And you can imagine the person kind of finding words to help in these, but also kind of adding their own particular sufferings in there and their own particular requests. What do you want God to actually do, right? <clears throat> so that's the second uh, the second major genre of the Psalms. And in fact, that's most of the Psalms are laments. Well, not most, it's the plurality, right? There are more laments than there are of any other kind of Psalm. And another thing that's quite amazing about these Psalms uh, is that uh, the lament Psalms, there's, there's only a few of them that mention any wrongdoing. Uh, Christians, we think about lament probably as being tied to like, oh, our sin, we deserved it, right? Uh, you're kind of like kind of regretting your sin. And the one psalm we always go to for this is Psalm 51, which is important and a great psalm, but it's one of only a small handful that go on and on about our own sin. Most of the psalms of lament, there's 48 psalms of lament, 40 of them don't mention anything wrong that the person has done. Don't say, they don't say, I I'm sinful, I deserve this. 40 out of the 48, 40 out of the 48 Psalms of Lament say, God, I don't deserve this. And I think that's really important for us to think about for a second. Not that we're always in the right, but also that we're not always deserving of these things that happen to us. Does someone that you love have an illness that they can't shake, some sort of uh, 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 like cancer. Does someone you know and love have, uh, are they struggling with a bodily ailment? Um, there are so many places in the Bible where it says, you don't deserve that. You didn't earn that, right? Jesus in John 9, the, the man born blind, he didn't deserve that. He didn't earn that. He didn't, it's not a punishment for something. It just happens. So all to say that there are so many, so much suffering in the world that is not caused by people's individual sin that they have like heaped on their own head, you know, karmic kind of payment, repayment. That's not really, that's not the theology we find in the Old Testament. That's not really the, I don't think the theology we find in the New Testament either. But all to say that uh, most of these laments stress the, um, <laughs> the, the wrongness of the suffering that we encounter in the world and that no one deserve, deserves this. No one, no one deserves uh, bodily suffering. Um, sometimes people have done uh, things that they shouldn't have done and they're suffering from it. Um, but most of the suffering in the world seems to be caused by maybe other people or by chance itself or something, right? Um, and that seems to be what the Psalms lift up is that it's okay to be angry about that. God can take it. And the third type of psalm 
is the Thanksgiving Psalm. Uh, Thanksgiving uh, meaning uh, that something bad has happened to you. You've you've said a lament, uh, but then uh, God has done something. There's been some material change in your life, right? And things have gotten better. The, the gospel's happened, right? It's got, there's salvation. And then what do you do? Well, you then you run back and say, thank you to God. And so the Thanksgiving Psalms are oftentimes assumed to be said in some sort of religious setting, a local shrine or uh, or in the temple in Jerusalem where someone is offering a sacrifice of thanks, uh, thanks offering. Um, and there, it's often mentioned in these psalms, like you know, I'm, I'm offering the same, I'm offering a thanks offering, you know, like I'm I'm saying thank you, uh, and that's a way to say thank you is to bring gifts um, to the altar and share them with the priests and with other people in the community, uh, and and have a have a feast, have a celebration, right? So the Thanksgiving uh, kind of assumes the lament and often copies it, um, often has a bit of the lament in there. I used to say this, but now I say. Uh, so these three main genres of psalms, there's other genres of psalms out there too. Psalm 1 is not exactly a hymn. You might call it like a wisdom psalm or a meditative psalm. So the, Psalm 119 is a really strange one, very long, um, and it's praising the Torah. It's unique uh, in the Psalter. So there's a psalms, like Psalm 45 I mentioned is a psalm of like praising the king. There's other psalms in there that are that break this mold, but almost all of them fit in one of these three categories. So if you're reading a psalm, think to yourself, which psalm am I reading? Am I reading a, a hymn of praise, a lament, or a thanksgiving? And what's even more important, I think, than that, and this, this comes out of the work of Walter Brueggemann, uh, who was at Columbia Theological Seminary uh, before me, um, but who has written some really amazing stuff on, on the psalms. And he took this uh, um, observation made by Paul Ricoeur, uh, a French um, literary theorist, um, who uh, talked about this kind of three-part motion of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation, which uh, don't worry about Paul Ricoeur or how else that was used, but uh, Walter Bergman applied this to the Psalms, and I think it's just so brilliant and so helpful. What Bergman points out is that these genres are linked to these very distinct settings in life. So this is this is an older uh, insight from Hermann Gunkel, uh, but the hymns apply, uh, kind of assume this setting not just like something good has happened, but you can kind of think about this overall setting in life, like a time in life. The, the, the kind of function of this psalm is to express stability. Like hymns, if you, even if you read hymns of praise, like nothing changes in them. Like Psalm 150 is a psalm, great example of a psalm of praise. Praise God with the harp. Praise God with the lyre. Praise God with the flute. God is awesome. God is great. God is good. All the time. It's these hymns of stability, and there's, there's no like plot to it. Right? There's no story happening here. Um, stories are for laments and thanksgivings, but hymns just tell you everything's great, everything's good, right? Everything's going on. Uh, laments express need, right? I, I'm missing something, I'm lacking something, something is, is, is taken from me or whatever. And then thanksgiving expresses this recovery, something's come back. It's, it's joy, the joy of recovery. So again, here's Walter Brueggemann, uh, who wrote uh, uh, several articles and several books in the Psalms. Uh, and he points out, he, he applies Paul Ricoeur's uh, kind of three-part cycle of life, really. And he says, uh, it's about orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. So the Psalms help us to express the movements that happen again and again, these repetitive movements that happen in life. So orientation, I, I, I think of it like kind of metaphorically like a trip down the river in a raft. If you've ever been whitewater rafting, uh, there's parts where you're just like sitting, looking at the trees, everything's great. Oh, everything's, everything's awesome, right? Nothing really is changing much. Like you're just slowly kind of floating down this river and there's no turbulence in the water. Nothing's, nothing's coming up on the horizon. You're just kind of sitting there floating, looking around, enjoying everything. Everything's great. This is so great. This is so fun, right? These, uh, 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 if you think about psalms of the hymns, the hymns of praise being these psalms of orientation, which kind of assume that like the world is well ordered and they often express like gratitude, um, confidence, right? In the well orderedness of creation. You get all these creation psalms like Psalm 8, Psalm 33, Psalm 104, these like hymns that talk about the creation of the world. Psalm 145 is another great psalm of creation. Um, and they're like, the world is so good, it's created so well. You do get a little story there, but the story is about the creation of the world and how great it is. Uh, why is everything stable now? Because it was built so well, right? So uh, you also get songs, uh, the, the psalms, you can think of psalms of Torah, 
uh, the Psalms of like meditation or wisdom, these Psalm 1, Psalm 119 that I mentioned a couple times. Um, those are Psalms where like everything's kind of the same. Everything's, God made the world so good. It's all good. It's all good all the time. Uh, if there's anything bad, it's like people, bad people doing bad things, but that's just like a little bit of chaff is what Psalm 1 says. Oh, yeah, bad things happen, but it's just people. It's just chaff. Really, God set up the world so that if you're good, things will be good. Um, this is uh, the kind of thing that people can say when their world is well-ordered, when their world is secure. Right? The hymns don't always make sense to people because not everyone's living in a place where their world is well-oriented, where everything seems stable, everything seems uh, dependable, reliable, predictable. Um, who gravitates towards these kind of psalms? Well, it's people whose lives are secure, um, often well-ordered sometimes privileged, right, goes along with these kind of psalms, like uh, at some churches that I've served at where uh, everyone's pretty well off. Um, people really like singing these hymns of praise, and people sometimes don't like singing laments and don't like singing thanksgivings because they're kind of like a little icky. Um, but the psalms, the psalms of uh, the hymns, the great hymns, those are the good, everything's good, everything's, everything's great. Um, there's a danger, I think, to, to only saying things about uh, song, only singing songs of orientation. Uh, the danger, I think, is that um, you kind of don't want change. <laughs> you want things to stay the same, right? They're hymns of stability. Uh, you you can sort of hold on tight, white knuckle your way through life that nothing is actually changing, right? Um, but that's not actually true. Now, one thing to say is that the Psalter is bookended by these Psalms of orientation, Psalms one and one fifty. The Psalter begins and ends with these psalms of, of orientation. Um, but pretty quickly, we dip into something else, and that is disorientation. Uh, as I said, this, the first half of the Psalter really um, is predominantly laments. So Psalm 1 is all about praise. Psalm 8 is great praise. Uh, in between there, there's some pretty, uh, pretty uh, gnarly stuff happening. Um, like, uh, for example, Psalm 3. Uh, if you just kind of, you know, we start to kind of dip into the sad psalms in Psalm 3, right? Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying there's no help for you in God. This, this, this is a psalm of a person who's being threatened with death. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me, right? So, you know, please help me, right? <laughs> uh, uh, rise up, verse 7. Rise up, O oh Lord, deliver me, O oh my God. Like, help me out. I'm going to die, right, if you don't help me out. And then Psalm 4, answer me when I call, O God of my right. <laughs> help me out, right? All these psalms of disorientation. And these are psalms that are spoken by someone whose uh, stability has collapsed, who thinks something has changed. Their uh, organization and well-ordered world has started to decompose. Uh, and uh, some of these psalms are someone who's just starting to slip into disorder, God, please help me get back there right, 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 right quickly. Like, stop this from falling apart. And then you get some psalms that just, it's by someone who's, and most of the psalms, I think, are written by people whose worlds have just fallen apart. Something has happened. It's often, as I said, vague. Um, but uh, chaos has overtaken the order of the world for this person. Um, sometimes they just accept this kind of dislocation, but other times they kind of rage against it and resist it. Uh, they often want that old world back. Um, or they want God to hurry up and, build something new for them, but they find themselves in a space of pain. These, as I said, are the the plurality of the Psalter. There's more of these kinds of Psalms than any other kind of Psalm in the Bible. And as I said, there's no confession of sin in 40 of these 48 Psalms. Uh, so this is, um, uh, it, it pushes against some of our Christian theology or assumed Christian theology. I think it would help our theology to reflect on this fact. Um, uh, but uh, if if you only say hymns of praise to God in the middle of pain, because you think that's what God likes to hear, then you're not listening to the Psalter, which assumes that you're going to speak the truth to God no matter what. Uh, and if you think about it, I think that's, if you want a real relationship with God, if you assume that God wants an actual relationship, then you have to tell the truth. You don't want to present a false self to God, right? Just say whatever God wants to hear. That's kind of strange in a way. God knows everything, but God wants you to just kind of like sing through, th sing happy songs through pain. I think what God actually wants is for you to be real and honest. And if you look at the kind of heroes of the Old Testament, um, although I had a great biblical scholar mentor, Chun Leong Seau, who said uh, there are no heroes in the Bible except for one. Uh, the, you know, Moses is not a pure hero, right? Uh, neither is David. They all have their problems. But all to say, if you look at the people who we think of as heroic uh, in the Old Testament, um, they are honest with God. Uh, Moses yells at God. Moses complains to God bitterly. Moses tells God he doesn't want the job. Moses tells God to stuff it. I'm going to leave. Or God, Moses tells God, you're being cruel. 
by threatening this stuff, right? That is um, Abram, right? Think of Abraham, like talking back to God about Sodom in chapter 18. Don't do this. Don't don't kill all those people. What if there's some innocent people there among all this, right? That is to say, talking back to God, telling God what you really feel and really think is an honored thing to do in the Bible. It means you trust God to tell God the truth. So if you're honest with God, then you say stuff like laments every now and again when you feel like you are in a time, a period of disorientation, when you've lost those things that anchor your sense of identity, uh, when you uh, lose a job, right? When you lose a loved one, when you lose um, a sense of honor and respect in the world, when you lose um, a, a community that loved you, um, when you uh, lose a pet even, when you lose something in your world that kind of held some stability for you. Um, when you lose everything in a pandemic uh, and the world seems to vanish overnight, um, when, when you lose a sense that there's a future ahead of you, right? Um, uh, when you lose yourself in debt, uh, there's all kinds of reasons and, and, and uh, places where these work, right? These Psalms work, but they're meant to work in situations like that. So if you look at Psalm 13 with me, this is a great example um, of a psalm of lament, a typical psalm of lament. And it begins, how long, O Lord, and that's Yahweh, right? How long, Yahweh, will you forget me? This is how it starts. It starts with how long do I have to sit here and wait for you? Now, think about how we start prayers. Oh, gracious God, God of all good, God of, starts all, th- you know, created all things and so on. We start with like, Everything's great about God, and God, I love so much. You're so great. You're so great. Um, there's one little thing, though, that I'd like to ask for, please, and I know I don't deserve it, but please, you know, look at the chutzpah that this Psalm 13 starts with, like the guts, right, that it's starting with. How long do I have to sit here and wait here for you? I mean, imagine saying that to, like, your spouse or, like, a loved one, right? Imagine saying that to a parent of yours, right? How long do I have to sit here and wait here for you to show up and help me? I mean, that takes a lot of guts to say that, but also takes a lot of trust that the person that you're saying it to is going to say, okay, tell me why. Uh, Help me understand, right? How long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? The reason that the psalmist believes that they can say these things to God is because there's a covenant. God has promised to be there for you. And you've promised to love God and worship God and serve God. It's a deal. You can call God on the deal. You can tell God, how long do I have to sit here and wait for you to make good on this deal? You promised me. The, the, the psalmist is not being rude. That's not rudeness. That's trust. <laughs> I, tr- I trust you, which means I'm getting fed up by waiting here for you, right? I, I, you're going to be here, right? Verse 3, consider and answer me, Yahweh, my God. Yahweh, you are my God, which means you better help me. I'm trusting in you. I'm, I'm putting my life in your hands. Consider me. Look down here. Look at me. Answer me. Say something. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I'm shaken. Now, these are reasons... These are motivations that you're giving to God. This is like bargaining with God. Hey, you better help. (laughs) You better help because I'm going to die if you don't help. There's another psalm that does this too. This this seems like kind of gross to some Christians. Like, oh, you're going to like bargain or wager with God? No, what it means is, God, you care about me, right? I'm going to die if you don't show up. So you better show up. Psalm 6 does this too. I love Psalm 6. It's so direct and forthright. It starts, oh, Yahweh, do not rebuke me in your anger. I don't deserve this, is what Psalm 6 says. Do not, don't, don't, don't you dare say that I deserve this. Or discipline me in your wrath. Don't do that. Be gracious to me, Yahweh, for I am languishing. I'm dying. You better be gracious to me. Give me your grace. Yahweh, heal me. My bones are shaking with terror. My soul is also struck with terror. While you, oh Yahweh, how long? Now, the, the way that's written, it's like the sentence breaks off and the person says, how long? It's almost like the person says, while you, I'm sitting here waiting, I'm, ter- I'm terrified, I'm shaking, and you're up there, but you're, how long do I have to wait here? Right? The sentence doesn't end. It's like broken off by this interjection, how long? Right? While you, it's beautiful poetry, but it's also like, I mean, it's so abrupt, right? Turn, O Yahweh, and save my life. And that word turn is also the word used for repent. You better turn around like you've turned your back to me. But also it's like, 
You better you better reposition yourself to me. You better make make up for this, right? Bring some flowers when you come help me, right? Turn, save my life. These are commands, by the way. These are imperatives. These are commands. Turn around, save my life. God doesn't say, no thanks. God says, write that down. Put that in the Bible. I want you to say that over and over again. Just think about what this assumes about our relationship with God. Turn, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. That steadfast love, that phrase, it's um, the Hebrew word chesed. You might have heard that before, chesed. Um, And it's translated steadfast love. I think it's better translated as covenant loyalty. It has to do with the covenant. Like, you promised me, you made a deal with me for the sake of you being a loyal God. Deliver me, save me. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, the land of the dead, who can give you praise? In other words, you want me to die? You, you better save me. <laughs> you, you, you want my you want my praises, right? You want my you want my praises? Then then save me, right? You you like me singing to you. You want me to sing your praises? Then you better show up. So in verse six it says, "I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears." And in the Hebrew this says, uh, I, "I I um I every night I I make my." bed, swim, my couch, couch and bed are the same thing in biblical Hebrew. They were kind of used for the same purpose, sitting, lying down, reclining. But every night I make my couch or bed swim with tears. You can think of this like furniture. Every night I make my furniture swim with tears. I'm crying so much that I'm filling up my room and I'm like up here and I'm about to drown. Uh, You better come help. But then the Psalms of disorientation always take this twist, this really kind of amazing twist. After saying, don't punish me, help me, you better show up, don't you like my singing, you love me, right, so come help me, we signed a covenant, right? Uh, and there's description of the pain that the person is in and the suffering that they're, that they're undergoing. But then there's this turn. So like verse 8 in Psalm 6, depart from me, all you workers of evil, for Yahweh has heard the sound of my weeping. There's this turn to trust. There's this turn to, to belief. If you look at Psalm 13, Verse 5, it says, But I trusted in your steadfast love, in your covenant loyalty, your chesed. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing to Yahweh, because Yahweh has dealt bountifully with me. Like, it's going to happen. Now, it hasn't happened yet in Psalm 13, but it's going to happen. God's going to come. Now, where did this trust come from? Where did this faith kind of come from? Uh, It's not exactly clear. Um, This, it's this moment of turn. Now, some people think that this might have been like the priest is like, the priest's words are not in the psalm, but the priest would have said, God, God has heard your plea and God will help. Other people think it's just like, you, you faithfully lament for long enough. If you are honest enough with your lament, you're going to gain confidence and trust from that. You're going to gain faith from that. And eventually you're going to pivot. And this shows us that, that, that eventual pivot to praise or to confidence at least this kind of vow um that you're like, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna worship you in the temple so this movement there's a movement away from disorientation towards something else you can see the hints of it here at the end of these psalms uh hints of moving towards an uh, an orientation but an orientation is not the same exact thing as uh, as, as the old thing. As, as Brueggemann says, uh, you know, one minute you're in Egypt, oppressed, disoriented, and the next minute you're going through the Red Sea, <laughs> looking at the fish and, the, and, and you know, swimming, we're swimming past you as you walk by them. Uh, and, and then you're in a new world altogether. Not the same place you were. You're just in a new space. And, and that's the gospel. That's the, the work of the gospel in a way. And so that is to say that we don't come through suffering and grief to the same place we were before, the same people we were before. Instead, we come to a new place. Uh, you, there's a day that your world starts to make sense again. Um, it's not the old world you had. Let's say you lose a loved one. Um, you go through this period of pain and disorientation. And then it's not that life seems all right, like perfect again or something. Uh, it's just that you find a new life, a new way of being in the world. Uh, you find a new identity. You lose a job and you you eventually kind of lose some of that world you had when you had that identity that you got through that work or something, if you did. Uh, and then there's a 
time and place at which you realize you're not hurting for that anymore. The, the pain's kind of scarred over, but you're not in the same place you were. You're in a new place. You're, you're a new person. Uh, you have a new orientation. So this movement from orientation to disorientation to new orientation then ends with this transition from the lament psalms to thanksgiving psalms. And these thanksgiving psalms all kind of bear the marks of the suffering in the same way that Jesus resurrected bears the marks of the cross still, right? The, the holes in his hands, right? The, the, the marks of suffering never leave us, um, but we move past them and through them in a way. These Thanksgiving Psalms also have this kind of uh, um, sense of uh, being scarred, keeping the scars, um, but also that you kind of show the scars as a testimony to God's power. So Psalm 30 is a great example of one of these uh, of these Thanksgiving Psalms. And it starts with, I will extol you, like I'll praise you, O Yahweh, for you have drawn me up. You, this is a metaphor for being pulled up out of the pit, like I was in the pit of death and you pulled me out. You did not let my foes rejoice over me. Oh, Yahweh, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. So this is in the past tense. I cried out and you healed. Oh, Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from those gone down to the pit. You saved me. And then the person talks to the, to the crowd. Usually these Psalms assume that there's kind of a crowd of people. This is your testimony. This is your witness. You've assembled a group of people. You say, I can't, I'm, I can't wait to tell you, to sing to you about, about what God did in my life. Sing praises to Yahweh, O you his faithful ones. So everyone who's gathered together, let's all sing to God. Let's give thanks to God's holy name. For God's anger is just for a moment, but God's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. So again, this like idea that like there's a movement. Life is a movement between these different phases of orientation, disorientation, and the new orientation. And as for me, I said in my prosperity, verse six, I shall never be moved. So I used to be oriented. This is the this is the world of orientation, right? Everything's great. I'll never be moved. Nothing will ever change. I'll be the same forever. This is awesome. I'm praying every day. Everything's going great. I'm 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 serving my community. Everyone loves me. Oh, I'm great at my job. Nothing bad can ever happen to me. By your favor, O oh Yahweh, you would establish me as a strong mountain. And then in the middle of the verse, as if to show how sudden this happens, and then the poetry kind of does this too. There's these like long lines, and all of a sudden, the, like there's this break in the poetry, and you get these short little staccato words here. You hid your face. I was dismayed. You would establish me as a strong mountain, but then God's gone. Where did God go? I don't know, but you were hiding, and my life fell apart. It's the honest truth that this person is telling. And it's, again, surprise. The disorientation comes out of nowhere and everything seems to fall apart. But then what does the person do? The person doesn't lose faith. The person yells at God. <laughs> Verse eight, to you, O Lord, I cried. I cried out. I said, I don't deserve this, right? And to Yahweh, I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Yahweh, and be gracious to me. O Yahweh, be my helper. This is the lament that has been stuck into the, the Thanksgiving psalm. So the Thanksgiving psalm bears the mark of the lament and repeats the lament because you're not going to hide the problems that you had. Because showing the problems that you had and the way that God worked through them and passed them and overcame them is a testament to God's power and glory. So... But the, the, this lament, I love this lament too, where the person says in verse nine, what profit is there in my, what are you gonna gain from my death, God? You love me, you love hearing my voice sing praises to you. I just love how self-confident this is, right? God, I know I'm a peon, but you said you love me. You said that I am made in the image of God. You said I'm made in your image and that you love me and you care for me. I'm gonna take you up on that. I'm gonna trust that you were telling the truth. You better help me. <laughs> You better help me because I'm going to turn into dust pretty soon. And that's, that's not going to praise you. You're going to miss my voice in the choir. It's an amazing bit of trust here that seems almost foolish, right? To say out loud, but also just shows you this depth of love that the person has for God and trust in God uh, that only really shows up because of their dismay, their honesty at their dismay. Uh, so let that be a lesson to us, I think. But then that last bit, verses 11 and 12, this is that turn. 
You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth, my, my, my clothes of grief, and you have clothed me with, with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. Oh, Yahweh, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So with my uh, kind of rafting analogy, right, these things pop up that are going to turn you over and flip you out, but then you all get back on the raft together, and then you celebrate that you made it through okay. Uh, you can see this happening in life all the time. Uh, again, it's not that you're in the same place you were at the beginning of the rafting trip. You're in a different place now. You've gone through some stuff. You've changed at the end. Um, uh, but you can kind of taste a new life. T things start to make sense again in a new way, a new sense. And if you stick with that long enough, that new orientation eventually becomes normal. And then you start to feel stable. And then you start to feel structured. And then you start to feel like you're back in orientation again. So orientation, these hymns that you can sing, laments, these ways to express our disorderliness of life and our feelings of grief and chaos. We have imprecatory psalms where we curse people. I can get into that some of the time in some other video, but the ones where you're cursing enemies, um, oftentimes this is a real human emotion. You get mad at enemies. It doesn't mean you're gonna go out and hurt people. It just means you need to express that kind of bile that's in your body. Tell God what you feel, even if it's like, I hate these people. You can tell that to God. And then you can say, God, do something with this emotion. Help me with it. But it's what I'm feeling. And you can think about the Thanksgiving Psalms. When you've come through to this point of saying, I'm okay. Uh, things are okay. It's a new kind of okay, but things are okay. That cycle of orientation, disorientation, and new orientation is something we all feel throughout our lives. And we're gonna go through this cycle again and again and again. It's the cycle of life. It's the cycle that all, all life forms go through. Uh, and it's the journey that we're all on. Uh, so it's not about trying to struggle to keep yourself in orientation all the time or pretending like you are in a season of orientation at all times, which is kind of how a lot of us are socialized. You're supposed to just pretend you're, everything's okay. Instead, I think the Bible encourages us to be honest and faithful to the seasons of life that we're in. And when we find that we don't have the script in a way, we don't have the words, we don't know what to say when we're angry at God. We don't know what to say when we're suffering. We don't know what to say when we've just gone through hell and back and we find ourselves kind of feeling all right again. The Bible gives us this language to say very specific language. Uh, it was general so that we can all step into it, but specific in a way, kind of being uh, being honest to these different seasons in our lives. Some of these um, uh, Psalms of new orientation or Thanksgiving Psalms, you can say Psalm 30, like I read. Uh, Psalm 34 is another good one. Psalm 40, Psalm 138. Uh, there are communal Psalms of Thanksgiving, Psalm 65 and 66 for a whole community that's gone through some stuff and it's come out on the other end okay. There's other songs we could say of like confidence that are like talking about bad things happening, like Psalm 23, one of a lot of people's favorite psalm, or Psalm 91, that's talking about going through those seasons of disorientation, but giving confidence to us that we're gonna come out on the other end okay. Uh, so if you read a psalm and you say, this doesn't make any sense to me, um, maybe you're reading a psalm from the wrong season in life. Uh, find some stuff that works for you, helps you to say the things that you feel like you need to say right now. Uh, that's think of the psalm as a kind of, as a kind of a resource book to help you get in touch with who you really are, what you're really feeling, and what God really needs to hear. Okay, so that's just one example of uh, the books in the writings. Uh, we can talk about Proverbs being a book uh, of wisdom, uh, but I'm going to save that for next time when we talk about wisdom literature of the Bible. I'll catch you on the next video.